Iran is a country that gets a lot of attention. Whether its nuclear ambitions are the target of a broad multilateral deal, or at least it was, or a significant player in Middle Eastern politics. To many, Iran is one of the chief bad guy countries in the world right now. Heck, they were even part of the Axis of Evil. However, you and I both know that when powerful nations portray another country as irredeemably bad, that way more is going on. Let's look at the origin story for the Iran of today. Hi, I'm Tristan Johnson. This is Step Back History, where we see history sideways. Iran today is one of the big players in the Middle East. People have been living there for an absurd amount of time, a scale set in the multiples of thousands of years. It has gone through many different religions, cultural upheavals, and dynasties. The Iran of today has no king, however. It's an Islamic Republic, a sort of mix of theocracy and democratic republic. The origins of Iran in its modern form traces its roots to the late 1970s, but the story of how we got to the Iran of today is a bit older. Our story starts during a game. Well, the Great Game. The Russian Empire in the north and the British from India in the south treated this region as a massive game of settlers of Catan in the 19th century. In a series of wars of conquest, Iran, called Persia back then, lost much of their autonomy to foreign influence. Local merchants struggled to compete with the colonial advantages of Europeans bringing in goods. This manifested in a wave of anger towards the ruling Qajar dynasty. They believed he was a leader who cared little about his citizens, probably because he did things like give British entrepreneur Julius de Reuter the right to control all of Persia's factories, mills, resources, roads, telegraphs, and many other public works in exchange for a cut of the profits. However, the anger erupted when the leader Nasser al-Din Shah, who you might remember from my Baha'i video, allowed for the British to hold a monopoly on tobacco in Persia. The angry hundreds of thousands who would lose their livelihood from this deal pounded the streets to protest this monopoly. But what's important is that the merchants got help from a group called the ulema, the Islamic scholar class. These were the people who ran the schools, charities, and judged court cases. The ulema declared an 1891 fatwa, or Islamic legal decision, outlawing the use of tobacco. The fatwa functioned as a successful tobacco boycott. The shah canceled the deal, and another fatwa allowed for smoking again. This action was vital because it was when the Marja al-Taqlid, the highest religious and legal authorities in 12 Shia Islam, flexed their power against the Shah, something which would lead Iran down the path to revolution. Iranians call this period of protest the Tobacco Rebellion. The victory was short. The financial situation of Persia led to the next ruler, Mozaffar Adin Shah Qajar, to make more concessions to foreign, but especially Russian, influence. His own lifestyle costs resulted in the Shah seeking out loans from the British and the Russians. To pay back that loan, Iran levied tariffs. These taxes led to another uprising similar to the Tobacco Rebellion. To receive sanctuary from the Persian government, protesters took refuge in an important mosque. However, the government violated the sanctity of the mosque to disperse the crowd. This incident made the demonstrators explode in number, and tons of people agitated to oppose the Shah. Protesters clashed with Russian elite Cossack troops. A descendant of Muhammad himself died in the fray, and the protests never ceased. The demonstrators eventually forced the Shah to dismiss his prime minister and give power over to a house of justice which would ultimately become a parliament. The Persians made a constitution for the first time. Figuring out how to make a new parliament work is a fairly unstable process. After the constitutional revolution, a Persian Cossack general took power in a coup in 1921. The general deposed the last Qajar Shah and paved the way to make a constitutional monarchy. He went by the name Reza Shah. 
he reformed the relationship with Russia with a treaty of friendship with the USSR. This new Shah tried to implement many pro-Western reforms, including the replacement of the Islamic legal code. This included brutal crackdowns on Islamic clothing like the hijab. Police would tear them off women in the streets who wore the veil in protest of the reforms. As you can imagine, this made the new Shah less than popular. Remember all those concessions of Iran's resources to European powers? Well, one resource becoming more and more relevant was oil. The monopoly company was called the Anglo-Persian or Anglo-Iranian Oil Company. The company grew very profitable, as in the most profitable company on earth. And guess how much of that immense wealth was moving to anyone but the Shah? Come on, guess. It's a number between one and negative one. Iranians lived in poverty while the British oil barons pumped the most essential resource on earth from under their territory. Those oil barons would later go on to become British Petroleum or BP today. Luckily, Persia was now a democracy. The protesters listened to all those nice liberals and instead of just being angry on the streets, they made their voices known with their ballots. In 1951, the Iranians exercised their freedoms and elected a new prime minister who vowed to bring the resource wealth of Iran back to the Iranians. His name was Mohammad Mossadegh. Hey, success! Iran's wealth was going to belong to its people again. Score for the good guys! Well, the British didn't take this rebuff so well and used their navy to impose an embargo on the Persian Gulf against Iran. Mossadegh didn't budge. He told the newspapers that he'd rather be fried in Iranian oil than give any of it to the British. British Prime Minister Winston Churchill tried to organize an armed invasion of Iran to force Mossadegh to surrender Iran's sovereignty. But American President Harry Truman put the kibosh on that. Churchill tried to form a coup, but Mossadegh ordered all British ambassadors to leave and shuttered their embassy before he could do it. So. What's a racist imperial warmonger like Churchill to do when Iranians won't turn over their resources to you and the Americans won't help out? Leisurely, just wait for the Republicans to get elected. In 1952, Dwight Eisenhower was elected president, and we can't let those non-white countries control their own oil, can we? In January of 1953, the CIA and the State Department let the British know that the US had their backs. It was time to remove Mossadegh to destroy the only democratic government in Iran's multi-millennial long history. Now, this event should be its own video, so I will go over the next events very quickly. The CIA orchestrated a coup of Mossadegh in something called Operation Ajax. The CIA installed a brief military dictatorship to impose the Shah Mohammad Reza Pahlavi to rule as a more powerful monarch. Just one more event in a long chain of the US stomping out inconvenient democracies to install pro-American dictators. I'm sure there will be many, many, many more videos in my future on these types of events. Hey, doesn't that explain why the Iranians don't like the US? Nah, couldn't be. What's a little toppling your elected government to put in a repressive dictator between friends? Anyways, without that inconvenient democracy to slow him down, the Shah set forth on a series of significant reforms in Iran collectively called the White Revolution. Some of these reforms were pretty good things. Some of these were kind of terrible things. All of them garnered a mounting traditionalist backlash that now associated stuff like the enfranchisement of women and literacy corps with the fist of US imperialism. Interventionism just always works out well, doesn't it? The White Revolution was another stab at westernization, as well as an attempt to dismantle the major institutions in the country that oppose the Shah's rule, like the merchants or those pesky Islamic scholars. His efforts to limit the powers of landlords and the aristocracy, except himself of course, led to the Shah making new enemies. Land reforms and education produced a lot of urban workers and intellectuals, none of which were big fans of the monarchy, especially since the government outlawed unions, political parties, and independent media. Oh, and the Shah believed in the nonsense of trickle-down economics. The inequality gap grew massive, and that doesn't make you friends. 
The Shah appeared despotic and disinterested with the welfare of his people, probably because the Shah was despotic and disinterested in the welfare of his people. Do you know who seemed to have the interest of the massive numbers of unlanded laborers at heart? Those Islamic scholars and clergy from earlier in this video. One particular cleric important to the story was the Ayatollah, an important title in the Twelver Shia faith. His name was Ruhola Khomeini. During these changes, Khomeini emerged on the scene as a prominent enemy of the Shah. He declared the Shah's actions as setting Iran on an inevitable path towards ruin. After leading a series of significant agitations, the Shah exiled Khomeini from Iran, where he lived for 15 years in Iraq and later in France. Khomeini's influence was not gone, and the pieces he set in motion did not go away. He developed ideas through his writing formalizing the opposition to the Shah's reforms in the context of an international movement against Western imperialism. He combined these ideas with an Islamic legal code that opponents of the Shah saw as the way to liberate the colonized world from Westerners. Those opposing the Shah began to espouse this ideology, which included the concepts of a nation ruled by an Islamic scholar class. The opponents of the Shah were not only religious authorities. Those who wanted to see a return of Iran's democracy agitated against the Shah's actions as well. They included Marxist groups and liberals who wanted to bring back the constitutional monarchy. Khomeini, despite being against these actions, managed to sway these groups under his leadership by focusing on the common issues they held together. Things were unsteady, but hadn't boiled over it to straight up revolution. It would take a few events over the 70s to bring things to a boiling point. Some extravagant spending here, inflation and growing inequality there, oh, and of course, a new tax. Finally, the secret police of Iran, the Savak, were blamed for the death of a prominent Islamic scholar and the Ayatollah Khomeini's own son. The funeral for his son brought the Ayatollah back into Iran's attention. Mourning events happened in major cities around the country for the Ayatollah's son. Soon after, an anonymous article denouncing Khomeini sparked a protest by seminary students in the city of Qom. The clash with the police resulted in the death of as many as 70 protesters and as many as 500 injuries. The death of the students pressured the more moderate clergy members to get involved in the protest against the Shah. The alliance between merchants and clergy dating all the way back to the Tobacco Rebellion allowed for a movement to quickly develop around the country. These turned into significant protests, which escalated into full riots. The government deployed the army to suppress the uprising, with death tolls varying wildly by as many as hundreds and as few as six. The government was not ready to handle protests on such a scale. Police didn't even have riot gear, and often they needed the military to intervene. And despite orders not to use deadly force, did anyway. This response led to various acts of escalation, such as the burning down of a movie theater with over 400 people inside with the doors barred. Both sides blamed each other for the fire. By August of 1977, the number of protesters numbered in the hundreds of thousands. Rampant inflation led to austerity, which put lots of young men out of work. Woe to anyone who makes an enemy of a lot of unemployed young men. It's the universal symbol some severe stuff's going to go down. The government declared martial law after the bombing of a bus full of American workers. The Prime Minister resigned. The Shah responded by trying to appoint a Prime Minister he thought the protesters might like, and attempting to appease their every demand. The martial law involved a curfew, which the government stayed for an event called Eid al-Fitr, the big celebration at the end of the Islamic holy month of Ramadan. What was intended as an open prayer ceremony quickly became a march of between 200 and 500,000 people. The protesters demanded the Shah let Khomeini return and make Iran into the Islamic Republic he had written about. Four days later, 5,000 protesters took to the streets in violation of the curfew and clashed with Iranian troops. The soldiers fired into the mob, killing 64 protesters in an event now known as Black Friday. By the end of the day, Iranian soldiers had killed 89 people. This shocked and appalled the Shah, but the responsibility rested upon him. Workers began to strike. 
starting the day after Black Friday and bubbling into a general strike by late October. Most workers in Iran had walked off the job. The Shah tried to increase wages and appease the strikers, hoping to ease it down. The Ayatollah moved from Iraq to France, which, with a better telephone and postage system, allowed him to exercise a more direct role in the organization of the resistance to the Shah. While in Europe, Khomeini took interviews with Western media, portraying himself to the world as a man fighting for the liberation of the Iranian people. Journalists ate it up, and Khomeini became a media darling. He forgot to mention that he intended to impose a theocratic government. In November, the leader of the secular resistance and Khomeini met to draft a new Iranian constitution, one that would turn Iran into a democracy and follow Islamic legal authority. It was the solidifying of an alliance between those that opposed the Shah on constitutional and on religious grounds. In Iran, protesters destroyed symbols of the West and the government. Demonstrators clashed with the military in a massive riot in the Iranian capital of Tehran. Those young, unemployed boys trashed Tehran in an event called the Day Tehran Burned. Eventually, the army and the police gave up. In response, the Shah fired the prime minister and appointed a military government. That day, he made a fateful speech on state television, claiming he was necessary to see the changes they want and admitting wrongdoing in the corruption and excesses of his regime. Khomeini responded, saying that there would be no reconciliation and that the only solution was to depose the Shah. The revolutionaries didn't see anything but weakness and were ready to close in with victory in sight. The protesters scheduled massive protests for the Shia holidays venerating early martyrs, bringing out crowds in the millions. They demanded the return of Khomeini and the resignation of the Shah. Roughly 10% of Iranians came out to these demonstrations. Later that month, the Shah did indeed step down. Khomeini returned to become both the religious and political ruler for life. Now, the leadership of the revolution was traditionalist, especially when it came to the role of women in society, at least in theory. In reality, many women voted, marched, and chanted alongside the men. Khomeini returned to a shell government propped up by the Shah before he left, led by Prime Minister Shapur Bakhtiar. People cheered and tore down every symbol of the royal rule. Bakhtiar promised an end to authoritarian rule and the return of a democratic government. He even offered to make a city-state in Qom like a Shia Vatican city for Khomeini to rule as a spiritual leader. This wouldn't do for the newly returned Ayatollah, as he needed to take a helicopter to get past his millions of admirers who came to watch him arrive, he promised to overthrow this shell government and install a new one based on the Islamic Republican principles. He made a provisional government in direct opposition to Bakhtiar. Khomeini ordered demonstrations to show how popular he was, and he told the Americans to withdraw their support of Bakhtiar's regime. Bakhtiar's government began to defect, and the military, unsure of who to support, was paralyzed. The rebels got their hands on a weapons depot, and the military officially announced it was not going to intervene against the revolution. Iran now belonged to Khomeini. Bakhtiar fled the country, living in exile until his assassination in 1991. Iranians celebrate this period every year as a national holiday. Hey folks, Intermission Tristan here to give you this week's call to action. This video was a result of a stretch goal on Patreon. I saved my juicy, controversial, likely to get demonetized videos for these goals. Next up is a history of Al Qaeda. There are a bunch of great perks, including early access to step back videos. If you can, it would really help to pledge even as little as a dollar a month over at patreon.com slash stepbackhistory. Now, back to the show. The revolution was over. Ayatollah Khomeini now ruled a country with a collapsed economy, disorganized military and police, and several rival factions within the revolution. Khomeini spent the next several years crushing local rebellions, defeating political rivals, fending off an invasion by Saddam Hussein's Iraq, and consolidating his power. The fight was now not against the Shah, but a clash between those for and against turning Iran into an Islamic fundamentalist state. 
His consolidation of power rings true of a lot of revolutions. Angry committees, kangaroo courts, arbitrary arrests, a lot of executions, and of course, a new secret police. Marxists tried to resist the theocratic forces, but could only hold out for a few months at best. Part of this period of turmoil involved arresting 52 American diplomats accused of propping up the Shah's shell government. Iranians surprisingly didn't forget that coup in 1953. They kept the hostages for 444 days, resisting an attempt to free them. Iran quickly emerged as part of the growing Third World Movement, an attempt to deny influence from either the Americans or the Soviets and forge their own independent path during the Cold War. They supported movements as far abroad as the Irish Republican Army, the Sinanistas in Nicaragua, the fight against apartheid in South Africa, and even the communists in Afghanistan. At home, the revolution went the way Khomeini wanted. Iran is now the Islamic Republic he wrote about. Women's rights have massively backslid, and the Iranian government routinely comes under fire for its brutal executions. Human rights abuses run rampant, and no one seems more angry about it these days than the Iranians themselves. In the last several years, massive protests have picked up against the rule of Khomeini's successor, Saeed Ali Hosseini Khamenei. Inequality is increasing, and the pinch of sustained sanctions is causing unrest. Iran's revolution is in a critical phase. Coming up on 40 years later, a whole generation without any experience of the revolution has come of age. They want the same things everyone wants, and it seems this regime has been trouble providing it. Today, because of this act of rebellion, Iran is an international pariah state. Attempts to bring them into the international community are often torpedoed by the British or the United States. They are a country today embattled on all sides by growing US imperialism in their neighbors, such as the early 2000s American conquest of Iraq. Their attempts to develop nuclear power in this context was met with a few thinking face emojis. Several international attempts to stop it included a surprisingly sophisticated cyber attack from the Israeli Secret Service and the Obama administration offering to bring them back into the international community in return for a stay on their nuclear development. That is, until someone pulled the US out, killing the agreement. Iran's revolution is a modern example of a familiar story. Colonization, intervention, and revolution created this both modern and traditionalist state. Where it goes next is anyone's guess. Uh, please deposit said guesses down in the comments. It really helps. Thanks to 12 Tone for the theme and Patreon patrons Don and Carrie Johnson, Colban Mani, Garrett Kwan, and Scott Smith. Be sure to subscribe and hit the bell notification for more history. Come back next week for more. Step back.